Hello, hello. I am Karen Jean-François, and this is the Women in Data podcast, a podcast where every other week I interview some of the most inspiring women working in data. They discuss how data is used in various industries, share their knowledge and experience in the field, and equip you with tips to help you overcome challenges on your career and feel great. Let's get straight to it. Welcome to another great episode of the Women in Data podcast. I am super excited today to have Riga Avron, who is the co-founder and CEO of Align AI and founder of Women in Analytics. And today we're just going to talk about a topic that has been on everyone's mind for a while. And obviously, because we record all our episodes ahead, there was no space on the podcast to talk about it before. But we are here to talk about generative AI, how it's disrupting our our field, really, our day-to-day, and to share some great advice on how to successfully integrate AI into an organization. Hi, Regan. Hi, thanks so much for having me on. I'm so excited. Yeah, I've been thinking about the conversation we are going to to have, and I'm super excited about it, just to talk about AI, but also talking about what you're doing with women in, in analytics. But before we get into that, can I invite you to introduce yourself? Absolutely. So I'm Reagan. I'm co-founder and CEO of Align AI. Uh, We started this company about three years ago. So we help organizations build, adopt, and govern their policies and procedures around data and AI. Boring to some, interesting to me, of course. (laughs) And then also founder of Women in Analytics, um, an organization based out of the U.S., that was started in, I think, 2016. So almost, yeah, about seven years ago. (laughs) That's what an achievement. And I, I love that you're like, oh, almost seven years ago, thinking that's been a while now. <laughs> yeah, has. Time flies. I also love your, your shirt. Does it say Align AI? I hadn't noticed. It does. Yeah. Oh, how cool <laughs> is that? You have some swag on, you know. <laughs> it's a shame we're not recording video now. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> Everyone will have to imagine our logo. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, thank you. Thanks again for, for joining me on the podcast for that. I feel like when you were saying, um, back in the US, I'm thinking this year I've been having quite a few guests from, from the US. So it, it's great to see that w- we can now cross borders and, and then share knowledge like, like that. I, I love it. So. Generative AI, I I feel like it's not I feel there is a hype around generative AI and most of us, if not all of us, have started using it. There is a lot of debate going on around the pros, the cons, and when it works well and when it doesn't work well. I, I just wanted to touch on how it's overtaken the, the conversations in, in the field recently. Yeah, it is all people can talk about all day long. I I have many, many conversations with data science leaders inside of companies. Just for some background, I've been in the enterprise AI space for almost a decade now. So this last year is an absolute anomaly in terms mm-hmm. of excitement and interest about AI, which is a good thing and also a challenging thing. So hype cycles are great because they provide a lot of marketing and a lot of interest, which means they get a lot of attention And then there's a lot of innovation that happens. And so that's why they're good. They're bad because there's a lot of education that has to happen in a short period of time. And we have to think quick on our feet about the downsides of technology, which there are to every single piece of technology we've ever built very quickly. And we have to figure out how we're going to adjust and try to prevent bad things from happening at scale. And so you know, the conversation I think is interesting. I, I've spent a lot of time thinking why people care so much about generative AI and they didn't care so much about other types or other forms of AI that we interface with every day, including social media, including things like Netflix. And so I think really it's this user experience shift where people mm-hmm. are getting to experience the power of this like reinforcement learning piece of AI. And they think that's fascinating. And they can spend more time personalizing their experience with it. 
And I think that got a lot of people's attention. It made it really easy for people to understand what is this and how does it work to an extent. And that got a lot of executives to be excited about it. But then the hype creates a big, you know, market push or market pressure. So then every company is like, what are we doing with this? How are we leveraging this? How are we going to be competitive with this? And you know, then then comes the hard conversation around AI, which is this is hard. <laughs> and we we're, we're gonna have to figure out a bunch of different fundamentals as a company in order to leverage it. So it's it's had its pros, it's also had its cons. And I think there's still a lot of interesting things to be figured out. Yeah, definitely. And something you you said, you know, you were talking about how much time you've been spending wondering how is that different than before? Because you said you've been in the space for 10 years. This year has been absolutely crazy. Why Why is that? And so this is not a question I've asked myself before. I was just thinking, oh, well, there is another wave. But this is definitely a bigger wave than than what we've seen before. And you're, you're right. So now we can interact with it directly. While what we were seeing before is... So what you're to- you were talking about social media, what's on your phone, etc. So we were more kind of passive users of it, while now we are taking an active part in the AI and seeing how it responds straight away. I know I've been using it a lot for the podcast. Everyone will know that social media is not my strength. So it's been helping me writing better posts and making my life so much easier. So I feel like everyone is just thinking about how is this going to make my life easier? How is it going to impact my job and then organizations? Rightly, as you said, how can we take advantage of it? So have you seen a lot of organizations changing their their strategies when it comes to AI because of that? Yes. Uh, Short answer. Um, The the biggest push is from usually boards or C-level asking or begging the question. And then the next step, from what I've seen is companies put these working groups or task groups together around AI. That's usually this like multifunctional type of group that includes folks like data science, security, like cybersecurity, legal, risk, uh, maybe procurement. And they're starting to run proof of concepts. They're starting to understand what are the areas or the levels, layers of abstraction that we need to comprehend about this thing? Can we do it once end to end to try to wrap our hands around it? And can we find a low risk use case to do that with? Uh, Can we figure out who our partners are going to be in this? Because that in and of itself is a full-time job. Yeah. Sifting through (laughs) who to trust, (laughs) who's going to help you it's new. And so for anyone to say that they've figured out something fundamental over anyone else is a hard thing to claim. So I think companies are overwhelmed, but they're putting these working groups together, which is a great first step. Get everybody to the table that needs to be at the table. Think about risk, think about usability, think about implications, start testing and learning. And that's what, exactly what they're doing. Usually I'm finding like internal workforce productivity use cases that are low risk yeah. that they can at least get started, start figuring out how complicated is this going to be? How bad is our data? You know, all of that fun stuff that, that you really need to figure out before you start scaling out these different types of capabilities. So I've found that to be a really interesting starting point. The biggest problem I've noticed, or that at least has been communicated with me from a lot of these big companies, is education. So education from your everyday individual, like, please don't put sensitive information into chat GPT, or be aware of deep fakes that are getting better and better around voice and video and text and images. So you know, from anywhere from that perspective to, hey, our our lines of business or our P&L owners need to understand how to identify use cases, how to think about risk and ROI uh, for these different use cases. And then, of course, even your technical folks like legal and procurement and risk, they need to understand how this works to an extent to be able to understand, like, what should we be thinking about in terms of policies? Do we want you know, how strict do we want to put these guardrails in place without getting into too much trouble and and not halting our, you know, momentum on the business side. So 
these are a lot of the actual conversations that are happening at companies today. And I personally have not run into a single company who has put one of these things in production yet. So... <laughs> Yeah, um, I have myself experienced and heard of teams being redeployed to work on LLMs. And when you were talking about risk and legal coming into play, I was thinking, oh, the headache that must give the banks. Because <laughs> they're like very highly regulated banks, insurances, all, all these things. 100%. Yeah, but something you said earlier that, that made me pause a bit was that the board was coming and saying, hey, how can we use this at our advantage? And it, it feels like the world has flipped upside down because how many years have we spent trying to convince people that data and AI and data science and all of these things are great and we can drive a lot of value um, for organizations? And now it, it just flipped all of a sudden. And because because of the hype and how available the, the AI is, it's them that are coming and saying, hey, what are we doing? So it's like there is almost instant buy-in and at least the work doesn't have to be done this time. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe it's going to be easier than than it used to be from that perspective. Yeah, for the longest time, I joke around that as data scientists, we've run around building things and going, look how cool this is. Hmm. Do you think this is interesting? Do you think this is cool? No? Okay. And then they go and they try to build something else. And like, do you think this is cool? Like, no? Okay. And so I feel like we've been doing that for like 10 years. <laughs> and the business is like, I don't get it. I don't care. That's neat. Thanks for explaining to me what, you know, some of these performance metrics are about the model. I don't really know what that means. You know, like they're just, it's been a lot of push and now it's being pull, which is great. So I talk about this like bottom up, top down approach to AI all the time. The bottom up is like, what can we do? And the top down is what do we want and need to do? So from the business, they're starting to think about what are some of the biggest problems we're experiencing as a company? What, what are some big existential threats? What are some areas of our company that are really inefficient or cost intensive? And how do we use AI for that? And then there's what can we do? So do we have data? Is it feasible? Is it clean enough? Do we have talent? Do we, I mean, there's all of these like feasibility questions that come after. And so I think it's just a really interesting time that we're actually prioritizing use cases now. We're thinking about your AI strategy should not be separate from your business strategy. It should be one. <laughs> and how, do that, how does one support the other? And a lot of, for a long time, we've just said, yeah, this AI thing, cool. Somebody in the corner is working on some model and we'll see how it goes in nine months. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because when you think about it, the the whole point of data science and, and AI is to enable business value and support the business. So you will definitely want, as you said, the, the strategy to be one. Yeah. That that's great. I was uh, <laughs> for a moment I wasn't looking at you. I was just scribbling down everything you were saying. I was oh, this is interesting. I love <laughs> your <laughs> your your bottom down and bottom up and top down approach and and all these things. That that's really nicely visually put. I I like it. Um, in terms of the strategy, so we talked a lot about how the strategy, you mentioned how the strategy should be one. Um, and we talked a lot about the different approaches. So when it comes to, so the data scientists coming and saying, oh, look at this, how cool it is. But now we've kind of shifted a bit that situation. What are the, I, I guess what we really don't want to be doing is to be repurposing teams, to look into LLMs and then in a year time, two years time, just give up on, on everything because th this brings so much opportunity, but we want to do it right. It kind of, the hype reminds me a bit of what happened um, earlier, maybe 10, 15 years ago when everybody was getting super excited about data science and now the excitement is going down a bit. I don't know if, I I want to hope that it's because we've integrated it, but being in the field, I'm not sure we've integrated it that well. <laughs> um, so I I would like to see a more successful outcome, uh, I want to say, from from that perspective. And you've been doing this for, for 10 years. So what have you observed that helps uh, success integ successful integration of AI? Yeah, I think this is going to sound boring, but it's really organizational structure. I mean, the 
companies that figure out budget adoption, uh, stakeholder buy-in, collaboration around data science or AI initiatives, they win every time. And everyone thinks it's, oh, well, they have this platform that does X. It's not. It's really organizational structure and people and being organized about this, which I know people don't want to hear because it's actually a really hard thing to change as a company. There are cultural elements that are really hard to shift. Oftentimes, it relies on really strong leadership who has a stake in the game to be able to prioritize this. And that kind of stuff is really hard to track and, and fix. And so most people boil it down to, well, we just, you know, we don't have a catalog. We don't have a, you know, MLOps platform. We don't have the infrastructure we need to fine tune these LLMs. Like people are always pointing to these like very technical challenges. And sometimes those can be blockers, but oftentimes those are very fixable. It's usually budget allocation and buy-in. Yeah. And that requires a level of education that requires a vision on and a strategy on how to implement this. And I think we are getting an at bat at that for a lot of companies. Like this is taking priority over a lot of other initiatives for the first time. And I think where we'll get burned is if companies don't do it right, you know, in, in the next year or a year and a half. We'll start getting fatigued. Well, we've been doing this for two years now and we haven't successfully ruled any of this out. And I think that's where you start to see this like dip mm -hmm. in excitement or progress. And I mean, you nailed it. So people got super excited about data science. It was the quote, sexiest job, you know, whatever. And that rode the wave after Hadoop and like the big data boom where people were just like getting Hadoop left and right when they didn't need it. And everybody was like, store everything, store all the data, doesn't matter the format, doesn't matter where, and we'll figure it out later. Well, we're obviously paying for that now because yeah. nobody can find data and all their data sucks and it's not great for data science. And, you know, we're not capturing causal data and there's all sorts of implications to that. And so I do feel we get another at bat here. <laughs> and to your point, I I don't know how many organizations are going to recognize the importance of doing this right and how many of them are going to play around with it for a little bit and then lose interest. Yeah, it, it will be really interesting to see what, what happens really. Because uh, back to your point of you know, everybody just throwing the data in one place, not caring about the use cases and how we're going to be <laughs> dealing with that and what form I, it's in. That's so true because at the end of the day, now we have to do even more work and spend even more money trying to fix that. And now you can see everybody, well, not everybody, but some organizations just saying, okay, this was crap, let's start again. Which I guess happens, but if we had thought of the fundamentals like you're talking about right now and at least trying to get that right rather than going and saying, oh, let's jump on the train and get this tool and this tool, maybe it would have been a, a different situation. Do you have anything else to say on that topic? Yeah, I think the from a strategic perspective, um, the best thing companies can do today is think about all these different facets of, do I have collaboration amongst all the major groups inside of my company? So security, legal, your PMO, your data science teams, IT, uh, your data teams. Do you have somebody representative at the table who can put their perspective into place? And then do you have a quarterback kind of running point on use case prioritization and integrating that with a business strategy overall? So I'd say that that's usually step one in terms of tactics around this strategy topic that we're discussing. And then step two is really getting to the rubber meets the road part, because you can create strategy all day long and you can get a bunch of slides and make them really pretty and get everybody excited. But if you don't have anything to show for that, no one's going to care long term. So get started. I think that's one of the major challenges that I'm seeing is everyone is spending time talking about these abstract concepts and what are we going to do, but they're too afraid to get started yeah. and they don't know where to get started or how to get started. And, and really the idea is just get started, pick a use case, get a working group together, 
get some trusted advisors who have seen other companies do this at least in the last six months, because others have at this point, and start putting it to work. Like start getting some experimentation going, start crafting some general policies, uh, start with some education, and it'll continue to snowball from there. But I think those are the two biggest things. Get, Get all the people at the table and the right people at the table and then get started. I think that's usually where I see people falling down. Yeah. Otherwise, if you if you do step one and not step two, then you just get stuck in the ideation. And that, that would be me, <laughs> planning forever and then not doing anything. <laughs> Um, I thanks for sharing that. I'm really curious. So we did mention a bit that uh, you're the founder of Women in Analytics, and I would love to hear more about that. What is it? Um, when was it born? Why was it born? And what what is it today? Yeah, I was in college when I started, and actually, okay, um, and it came out of necessity, really. I mean, it was really a a selfish motivation initially (laughs) because I kept going to these like meetups or local communities around data and AI. And I didn't see any women at these meetups or in these communities at all. And I was so confused by that. I was like, okay, data science I know is, is like challenging from a CS perspective. So if you look at the history of women in some of these fields, stats, there's a huge number of women in statistics. Uh And and if you just look in academia, you'll see that as well. Um, Same with math, actually, where there's a huge underrepresentation of women is in computer science. And that's actually getting worse if you look at the stats. And so I think what happened was data science was always stats heavy for a long time because it was research, right? You were usually doing it in the context of a specific field. We didn't generalize this idea of data science until like 10 to 12 years ago. And so what happened was as computer science was more involved in some of these applications, um, we saw less and less women in industry actually taking on because it was very CS heavy for a while. And still is. Um, there's there's a lot of nuance and complexity around uh, deploying these models and optimizing them and um, working with very large data sets and things like that. And so we just kind of saw a decline of women in the space. And so, you know, I got kind of confused because I was like, there's a lot of women in stats. I don't understand why I'm not seeing more women. And we I, I came up with this idea to come up with a like evening event. I was like, I'll just do one event and see who shows up. And we had like, I think 250 people show up at this little event that we did in Columbus, Ohio. And I was like, oh my gosh, there are women in this space. That's awesome. <laughs> they just didn't call themselves data scientists. And so I, you know, I, I saw a need for it and decided to do a bigger event. I'm like, well, if it's a problem in Ohio, it's probably a problem other places as well. Maybe we can, you know, launch a conference and invite people to come. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we did conferences for, I think that we did three before the pandemic hit. And then, uh, and that grew, it doubled almost every year, which was wow. crazy. And then during the pandemic, we were like, okay, we're usually a live events organization and we meet in person. And how do we continue to foster this community online? So we launched some like virtual membership type of activities to get people together online. And that went really well. And then we came back in person with our conference um, in 2021. And so um, it just keeps going from there, which is great. And, you know, I love collaboration and seeing all of these other groups as well, because we're all kind of unified under this one mission and getting more visibility to some of the women doing incredible work Mm -hmm. in this space is super important. And so I, you know, big fan of women in data, of course, and all the work that women in data has done to this day. Yeah. And I think it's, it's starting to get better. Like we're seeing more and more women at the table. We're seeing more and more women CDOs, we're seeing more and more women of influence in this space, which is such a great thing, especially in a day like today, where AI is very, it's going through its tech bro moment. That's what I've been saying. 
But definitely do you mentioned that during the pandemic you were running some virtual membership events. Do you still do the virtual ones or is everything in person now? Yeah, we have some we have a virtual community that we keep kind of humming along. We have a little um kind of mentorship program that we piloted this past year, which went well. And so yeah, we're just looking at ways we can provide more educational resources to uh women looking to get in this space and continue launching their career in specific directions. All right, brilliant. I will uh, definitely link the, well, share the link uh, in the show notes. And uh, something you said, so you remember when you said earlier, when you started working and you were going to, well, not working, but you were in college and you were going to events and you were thinking, where are the women? Um, it's funny because my experience was a bit different. So I studied math and statistics, so loads of women there. But then when I started working, The first event I went to, that was a, a few years after I had started working with women in data. Uh, so I never, I've never actually been at a conference where, well, now I've been a bit, but I, I feel like I've always been surrounded outside of work with loads of women from that perspective. But at work was painting a completely different picture, which is quite, quite fun to see the difference when you go to a women conference and when you go to a, a normal conference. Now I'm starting to go more to non-women specific conferences and I can see, yes, there is quite a <laughs> different crowd here. Well, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Before we close the episode, I just wanted to know if you could share any resources that you use that helps you in your career or personal development. Yeah, I'd say uh, the, the most effective resources that I've leveraged are mentors and individuals who I have an immense amount of respect for in specific areas. So For example, you know, uh, I've got a couple of mentors who are helping me from a leadership perspective, immensely helpful. It's hard sometimes to understand the amount of value that can bring, mm -hmm. but it, I've found it to be incredible. I've had a couple of mentors on the technical side. I've had some mentors to help me in my sales leadership and presence. And so I think finding those individuals is so, so important and creating great relationships and symbiotic relationships with with those individuals. In terms of other resources, I there's not a consistent one I go to in terms of like reading, but I will say that a lot of the resources that some of these women's women groups put out there are incredible um and just being able to meet new people in the space, I think they provide lots of great opportunities for that. And so I do like to participate in a lot of those groups just because they can create some incredible connections. And then technically, I like to do a lot of tutorials just to keep myself sharp. It's hard when you move into a CEO role at a company because you have to remove yourself from a lot of the technical nuance that you might have found super fun and interesting for a long time. So I, I like to read from a couple of different people. So um, Chip Wen is like an incredible blogger, technologist, teacher, professor, and she uh, focuses in the MLOps space and then has a lot of really great uh, content on the large language model kind of operations side of things too. So she's great. And then John Crone has the Super Data Science Podcast. That's always a good one. He has yeah. incredible guests on that. He also puts out a lot of really good educational resources, including tutorials on YouTube. And so I really like, I like his materials as well. Yeah, those are some, those are a couple of ones that I like to point to in terms of the technical resources. That's very rich. Thank you, Ren. I love that mentors came, <laughs> came first because I think it's very undervalued. So people are, are talking about mentors, but it feels like everybody is expecting one person to solve all their problems at, at once. So the fact that you really well described that you have people helping with leadership and then some helping with the technical side and some with sales definitely prove that. I mean, we all have different skills and I love that we're able to tap from different people to, to tap into their knowledge. Um, thank you so much, Regan, for joining me on the podcast. I had, I had loads of fun. It was a super interesting conversation. So thanks for, for coming. Thank you so much for having me on. I love this podcast. It's excellent. You do such a great job. So thank you again for inviting me. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Women in Data podcast. We will be back in a couple of weeks with a new guest. 
Until then, if you have two minutes, it would be great if you could leave us a rating or a review as it helps not only to make the podcast more visible but also to enhance the content. If you don't want to miss the next episode, follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We are also on LinkedIn. And if you wish to, you can even register to the community for free. All you have to do is head to womenindata.co.uk. Have a great day.